thank you so much for for the introduction dr uh, chavla and uh, shalini thank you for that for having me here it's a need a pleasure to be with all of you and uh, and let me start this talk uh, uh, a little bit of uh, hypothesis some amount of science uh, a large amount of interest i think uh, in 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 this particular uh, topic no conflicts of interest for me in this shalini i'm 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 audible right yes you are sir you are thank you thank you uh, so uh, i'm going to talk a little about human evolution a little about sleep and light prashashank already introduced you to this topic of metabolic switches and finally a uh, very brief uh, clinic clinical correlate very interestingly let me start actually about about human evolution and and uh, the important thing to remember is that over 5 million years of evolution you will realize that uh, what we have is a conserved set of genes that have been constant throughout uh, uh, history of human evolution <clears throat> these are about five or six genes that are called the clock genes and these set up our rhythms and we have found a way of coordinating these rhythms with nature and the gist of my talk is to say that when you have moved away from this uh, from this uh, relationship or this or created desynchrony with nature you have set yourself up for your, uh, for a disease uh just to give you an example cardiovascular acute myocardial infarction or asthmatic attacks or pulmonary edema they all peak at certain times of the day so clearly uh, if we choose to ignore uh, what nature is telling us we ignore uh, our own relationship with it it's also important to understand our own evolution we humans have the highest amount of fat why is that we have a highest amount of fat because we chose two modes of having evolutionary advantage one is that we have smaller number of progeny from a uh, proficiency in, in reproduction we thought we will have efficiency in reproduction that is why uh, we have less number of children that is why we have puberty and that is why you know uh, we we have uh, a matriarchal behavior which only elephants have and and that is why uh, our, our kids grow up to be smarter than us the second is we have chosen to have a larger brain and the larger brain requires like the fetus a large amount of glucose it's a very very important obligatory glucose uh, consumer there are some alternate fuels that we have now learned that the brain has and it can even create uh, pathways for taking alternate fuels me i think your slides are not moving krishna i am in the same slide i am in the same slide Achha, okay okay uh so and 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 that's the reason and and when because we need glucose we need fat why during times of stress the brain continues to consume glucose and uh, the other organs need other fuels for it to survive and that's really why we have fat and why we have insulin resistance is actually to allow the brain to take glucose when the others use fat so when there is inflammation when there is infection what happens is that the brain continues to take glucose insulin resistance occurs in other organs and therefore diverts the glucose to the brain therefore initially inflammation is a protective phenomenon and it's got linked with insulin resistance and together they were the first line of response to any external or internal threat but we started threatening our bodies too much simply because the last 100 years we started playing with nature <coughs> we eat more food more frequent food our quality of food has changed we eat more processed food we have more light less sleep disturbed sleep and a change in our circadian rhythms we have less physical work we have more sedentary time more screen time greater amount of stress no downtime and of course less sunlight more indoor time and controlled temperatures 
So what has happened is we are constantly in an inflammatory state. Instead of what was a mechanism for infection starvation, what has become is that there is a constant state of inflammation and this inflammation is creating insulin resistance. Very interestingly, what the body does is any amount of extra uh, nourishment, it stores for a rainy day. A given an example of this is, I don't know how many of you remember, but there are such redundant SGLT2 mechanisms in the, in the kidney that allows not a drop of glucose to come in the urine, right? Similarly, the body stores as much fat as it can. And that's why women who are more important than men from an evolutionary perspective have greater difficulty in losing weight. So if you look at this, one of the things that we know is that, that the insulin resistance is a key factor in MCP1 transcription. And, and just like inflammation produces insulin resistance, the earliest thing that happens in, an, in, an, in a fat cell is that obesity uh, bypasses the mTOR pathway that keeps the insulin resistance in check. The moment the insulin resistance is present, or if there is oxidative species by the JNK pathway, there is transcription of MCP1, not the male chauvinist that you know of, but monocyte, chemo tract, and protein 1. It sends a message to the macrophages uh, in, the, in the bone, and they come into the abdomen, and this beautiful slide by Suganami et al. tells you what happens then. These T cells that come into the abdomen they come as helper cells, but there's a phenotypic shift that occurs in the, in the abdomen. These become killer cells. And along with the fat cells, which are undergoing apoptosis, producing adipokines, and, and they, they start producing cytokines. At some point of time, the fat cell, which is supposed to protect the body from the effects of fat, undergoes lipolysis. The fat becomes ectopic. And overall inflammation and, and fat infiltration, including the pancreas, occurs. There's a slide of the, from Donut, Mark Donut from 2008, which I still use in my slides, showing the first instance of, of human islet cell inflammation. Later, and, and I've spoken this in many, many places, what happens is when islet cell inflammation occurs, the islet decides that the beta cell, which is a, which is a very, very high uh, energy maintenance cell, with humongous amount of mitochondria decides that if I continue to churn out insulin, it's quite possible that I may be marked for destruction. So it changes its, its behavior, and from an insulin producing cell, it, produces, it, it starts producing no insulin, or it becomes a glucagon producing cell or a ghrelin producing cell and loses its identity. More of that in another talk, but let's move on to what, what we are doing. There, is a, there are two things that we've interfered the most. One is the e, uh, uh, eating, wake, sleeping, not eating cycle. Meaning, for most animals, activity is linked to food and inactivity is linked to, uh, to catabolism, to detoxification and autophagy. This is a very, very old cycle. <coughs> it is preserved and is probably the fundamental nature of any cell. So when we disturb the fundamental nature of cells, they respond with inflammation. So just to tell you how important sleep is, I'm quoting Charaka, which means good sleep I always say sleep is over is, is underrated and sex is overrated. So happiness, misery, nourishment, emaciation, strength, weakness, virility, sterility, knowledge, ignorance, life and death, all of these occur depending on the proper or improper sleep. Right? And this is the Rigveda, the Rati Suttam that's saying Sano Yavan Yavanad Vikshami Vikshama Vikshamahi Vikshe Navasatim Vayaha, which means that sleep is like a tree that, that provides its branches for the birds to rest. And that rest is a very important. It's not just the sleep, it is the lack of light. We didn't know why sleep was necessary for many, many years. Until 2013, 
this beautiful, beautiful experiment that was done by a very dedicated PhD scholar who was able to get a rat under a confocal microscope to sleep. You know how difficult that is. What she and others demonstrated in this beautiful publication was that when the uh, when you sleep, the brain shrinks, the parenchyma shrinks, reducing the interstitial space by about a third. Almost a 60% decrease in the interstitial space occurs. Therefore, what happens is during sleep, these endolimbs open up, these channels open up, and the toxins get removed. That's the purpose of sleep. It's a, it, it is, it's a detoxification process. As is darkness, this is the Anuraprasnam from the Taitriya Aranyakam, and you will see what it says Sarvasvat Bhuvana Nadi Tasyaha Pavak Paka Visheshanaha Smritam Kala Visheshanam. When I first read it, I thought, you know, what are these guys talking about? The heat of the rays of the sun isn't just a light that entrains us. But what we now know is that the suprachiasmatic nucleus is not just entrained by light, but actually by heat, by, by temperature changes also. So these guys got it right. The time is understood through the changes brought about by the heat and the rays of the sun. Indeed, in diabetes, one of the first things that have occurs, and Ken Polonsky showed this way back in 1988, is a loss of rhythmicity that occurs in, in diabetes. <clears throat> there are rhythms in every, every single cell, and the loss of rhythmicity is the earliest that you see in diabetes. There's circadian misalignment. Once, let's say, you're traveling on, on across time intervals, uh, the first thing that changes is, is the put to our postprandial glucose and insulin. When you restrict sleep, and, and do, do a look at the human transcriptome, you will find out that many of the cells, many of the tra transcriptomes that are increased have to do either with cell, cell, cell cycle regulation or with inflammation. I love, particularly love this particular uh, trial by Kian et al. Uh, since uh, since it, it actually encouraged me to do my own work. And what they showed was in, in rats, just reversing the cycle from uh, LD to DL, which is light day, darkness to darkness light, caused a reversal in the insulin secretion, but also in, in a rat prone to diabetes, it caused beta cell dysfunction. Our own work showing the relationship between the quality of sleep and A1C elevation. In fact, I remember uh, reading a study from the VADT, I mean, from, I'm sorry, from the Veterans Affairs, showing that even using hypnotic, allowing people to sleep, improve their A1Cs. We did another trial, and uh, this is uh, funded by our own organization, PAMS, and we are looking at a further funding from the RSSDI for a different kind of trial. What we did was we, we, we put a bunch of rats through a, a reversal cycle, but also had a prolonged photo period like nurses do, an additional eight hour on alternate day, days for some of these rats, very interesting. You will notice that the glucose is uh, higher in, in, in those that have an extended photo period. An increased amount of triglycerides, increased amount of <coughs> change in the cholesterol. But what was interesting is this, and I, I want to show this to you, and this was uh, presented in the ADA in 2020. It's still going undergoing multiple revisions with the, with the current publication. But let's look at this. This is, a three, this is, this is at the end of three weeks. This is a, a beta cell, uh, I mean, this is the pancreatic beta cell mass uh, in, in somebody who's got a normal circadian period. Remember, rats are night feeders. When you reverse the light period, you see what happens with obesity. You see that, that the pancreatic beta cell mass is expanded. Uh, there's a greater, a greater mass as if it's a reactive phenomenon that's occurring. But what bothered us was this, that if in every other day you had an additional eight hours of light, the pancreatic mass, cell mass was actually starting to degenerate with enzymatic degradation seen. We didn't see much in terms of PER and other <coughs> molecular biology clock uh, genes, but that we will also do in, in our subsequent study. That brings us to this particular important part, which is the energy sleep cycle that this is hardwired. 
Remember, glucose is, is the fundamental uh, output of photosynthesis. Therefore, in plants, fungi, cyanobacteria, this dark light cycle is very important that during, the, during light, energy is available, uh, there is anabolism, and there is restoration in the dark. Similarly, in metazoa and all the others, there is a relationship between feeding, eating, and sleep. Feeding is anabolic time, sleep is restoration time. And, and remember that, that, that there have been others that who have looked at, for example, the moon. <coughs> <coughs> Lunar cycles are important in, in, in feeding too. <coughs> Menstrual cycles coordinate very well with the lunar cycle. But to go back, we have central molecular clocks that are present in, in, in the, in the, in the uh, SEN, which is a suprachiasmatic nucleus. The predominant input is the, is the, rod and, uh, is the rods of the, of the eye. But there are others like food that entrain it. And these in turn entrain the peripheral clocks which are present in every single cell. Cues such as food, uh, behavior, all the others train the clock. So if you change your food habit, you change uh, the way you eat, you're eating late, you're resetting the SCN clock and, and, and affecting multiple, multiple rhythms. And each of these have effects in the peripheral clocks. Importantly, this behavior changes, as, as Shashank was talking to you about the mitochondria, this is exactly what is happening in the mitochondria as, as a part of diabetes. There is a partitioning of fuels that is there in the mitochondria. Glucose propagates its own metabolism, right? And, and uh, lipid oxidation also propagates its own metabolism. Glucose enters the tricyclic acid cycle at the pyruvate. And while there's a small amount of ROS production, there's a smooth flow of the hydrogen ion chain and by four, there's a small leak that allows uh, other things to happen. The lipids enter at the peroxidase path. I'm sorry, at, uh, they undergo peroxidation and they enter the acetoacetate, which is a little less efficient of a fuel. But what is important to understand is glucose uh, inhibits insulin and therefore inhibits fatty acids. On the other hand, fatty acids inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenate kinase that prevents glucose from entering the pyruvate cycle. When you, it takes about 14 hours for, for the glycogen stores in the body to reach an amount of depletion and, and switch to a fatty acid cycle. But what happens when glucose is abundant and is present all the time and fatty acids are also active is that they don't know what, what which means the body doesn't switch from, uh, from glucose oxidation to fatty acid oxidation. This is called metabolic flexibility. And in diabetes, this is one of the first things to be lost. And when this happens, the effectiveness of the respiratory chain is reduced. There is a greater amount of respiratory uncoupling, greater amount of UCP2 that is pre present, therefore greater amount of ROS that is produced. This is one of the reasons why uh, there is progression of, of damage in diabetes. So the metabolic inflexibility, what does it do? It is mediated and, and you'll see these genes, these are called the MODI genes, you'll see the HNF4, HNF1. These try to prevent fatty acid oxidation and allow only glucose to be present. This is mediated by my favorite uh, protein, which is FOXO. FOXO is a beacon that goes into the uh, into the uh, nu uh, nucleus and tries to uh, recruit these genes and promote glucose oxidation. But at some point of time, FOXO also goes away. And what happens is that there is simultaneous glucose and fatty acid oxidation. And that happens, the, the partitioning of fuel risk, as we talk about goes away. What does that mean? Besides the other, other implications, one of the things that we know is that when glucose is absent, right, there is a, there, what really happens is there is some amount of cellular protection that occurs. 
that that activates both the rim 15 and the and the sirt1 pathway and confirming longevity when you keep eating all the time th- that takes that goes away while we don't know uh, and and it and it is and fasting has been shown to improve longevity in almost all species except humans uh, in, uh, and and that includes some some primates also so should we fast at least we should not eat so much i think i think a hypocaloric diet is very good should there be time restricted eating possibly uh, our ancients had time restricted eating remember they had only two meals right even the mantras that you use to 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 offer god there are only two mantras available one for the morning and the evening uh, but but clearly food was considered as a means to live but no, and not as entertainment that we think about it forget forget alcohol is an entertainment i think we glorify alcohol so much but food and foodies glorify everything so does time restricted eating help us so uh, in 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 mice lower cholesterol lower fasting glucose lower weight lower body fat lower inflammation lower dysbiosis and 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 clearly an in, increase energy expenditure endurance sleep cardiac function the human studies are very contra- contrasting it, and and with different outcomes simply because the methodology is 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 questionable but it does reduce weight in the short term but if you look at it carefully you won't see lots of uh, benefit simply because anyone who reads those trials can see that the methodology is faulty we really need good studies and also studies that are more in tune with the diet here to to see if these make a distinction but the sort of uh, as i said a lot of hypothesis a little bit of evidence some amount of animal work but this is my message to you at as i close one is you know i think there's nothing wrong in respecting ancient cycles i always believe that our ancients were not fools uh, it's just that uh, we we think that uh, uh, that they were simply because we only respect the zodiac god second there may be a role for time restricted eating and intermittent fasting certainly there's a role for exercise that helps us to bring the glucose uh, uh, to, to to take care of this alternate fuels like ketones have a role for example this is an anecdote that sundar mudaliar told me that that oxford has actually uh, patented a ketone drink and uh, uh, it, for the first time it was used in tour de france and 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 the team had an advantage interestingly median chain fatty acids especially c8 to 13 the one that all the international oil companies uh, like to debunk and western literature likes to debunk is coconut oil actually improves uh, mitochondrial function uh, i think what shashank talked today is the first of many mitochondrial modulators that will make it to the market but till then uh, here is a full thing uh, so langalam param aushadam is what uh, ancient wisdom said so with that let me stop Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak on this which is an area that is evolving and and has caught my interest for many many years now and i'm happy to share this information with you thank you very much